I can still remember it now. The day my father took me for my first snorkel in the bay. I was crammed into a homemade wetsuit by my grandfather and introduced to a different world. And I was hooked. Because even at the age of seven, it was abundantly clear to me that life under the sea was wild and natural, while life on land was shaped and controlled by people. I held my breath till my lungs felt like they were going to burst. To swim with dragons and jewels I never imagined existed. To see animals I only knew dead and limp on the pier, alive, and gliding through their world with ease and grace. My life was shaped by what I saw as a child as I grew up on the west coast of Scotland. Snorkeling in the shallows of the bay, I discovered many new creatures. Now, as everywhere else, much of what was living under the sea has gone, harvested by fishermen and damaged by pollution. My bay is a shell of its former self. However, in small pockets, undisturbed by man, there are still places that remind me of the past. This year, for the first time in a while, I've seen an octopus. Perhaps as a child, I dived with her great-great-grandmother. And now her daughters return to the bay to have their young. As long as I can remember, I have noticed the seasons that affect the village also affect life underwater. Winter brings dark and sluggish hours to the bay. The arrival of spring is a time of creation. With the sunlight, the germs of life take hold on land in the shape of budding trees and growing grass. Below the surface, it is several more weeks before the sunshine warms the water enough to waken the bay from its slumber, enabling the tiniest creatures to start to grow. These are phytoplankton. They are tiny plants, so we call their growth the bloom. Tiny animals graze on these tiny plants, and they in turn become prey to larger animals and so on up the food chain. These baby jellyfish are attached to a rock. In spring they will bud off as tiny free swimming jellyfish only three millimetres across. But they don't stay small for long. By the end of summer, these lion's mane jellyfish may have grown tentacles over 10 metres long. They look benign, drifting unanchored on the tide, but they are highly efficient hunters. Each tentacle carries thousands of stinging cells lethal to tiny animals that become entrapped in them. Below the drifting jellies, a mosaic of life makes up the underwater landscape of the bay. As a child, the seagrass meadows were one of my favourite places to explore. They are shallow and so easy to snorkel down to. There are lots of hiding places for animals in amongst the blades of grass. There's a spindly looking spider crab. And a hermit crab.
Believe it or not, this is actually not a plant. It's called a peacock worm. That fan is its gills, and it uses it to filter food from the water. As I grew up, I became stronger and more confident. I started to explore the outer reaches of the bay. In the rocky shallows, kelp grows in spectacular amber forests. Each blade of kelp jockeys with the next to soak up the sunlight. On the floor of the kelp forest, in the shade of the canopy, I find an octopus resting. Her eye is so much like our own. She examines me with mild curiosity. Now, as an adult diver, I still enjoy spending time in the kelp. It can take a while for your eyes to adjust, but exploring beneath the canopy can bring the greatest rewards. In places, sun streams through and illuminates beds of soft corals. These animals are made up of hundreds of tiny individual polyps. Each polyp acts like a tiny hand clutching at the passing plankton. An Aesop's prawn makes its home within the soft corals. I don't think he's noticed the octopus. Both the prawn and the octopus have the ability to change their colour to match their surroundings, but the octopus is the master at this. That prawn didn't even know it was there. At dusk, above the canopy, Pollock prowl for food brought to them on the tide. As another new day breaks, the early morning summer sun turns the bay purple. It only lasts a few minutes, but under the water there are parts of the seabed that are permanently this colour. This is a marl bed. It's made up of many fragile, individual pieces of hard seaweed. Marl grows really slowly, only one or two millimetres a year. The marl in the bay has probably been growing since the end of the last ice age. The marl is home to a community of over 500 species of animals and plants. Each time I visit it, I see something different. A pipefish, a bit like his relative the seahorse, but with a longer, thinner body. They are tough to spot amongst the sugar kelp. Pipefish seem to spend most of their time trying not to attract too much attention to themselves. This starfish is slightly different to most other starfish. It has two extra arms. The seven-armed starfish is one of the fastest, and I often see them hunting on the marl. But it's not the only predator here and this painted goby is unwittingly about to become prey to the true monster of the bay. The anglerfish. Anglerfish can grow to six feet long and weigh over 150 pounds. This is a small one. They were once common in the bay, but this is the first one I've seen for many years. As its name suggests, it spends most of its time fishing 
One of the spines on its back acts as a fishing rod. The angler casts it about using its fleshy tip as a lure. And it's only a matter of time before... a strike. The angler tries to suck in the goby with its huge mouth, but the goby escapes. He's lucky. The anglerfish moves on to try his luck with another unwitting victim. These little beauties could grow to 90 pounds in weight if we would let them. Our bay used to be full of cod, but the adults are all fished out now. We only get these guys at this size before they move offshore to take their chances in the deep, open sea. Every now and then, I will dive to a part of the bay that sees little sunlight. Here I find prawns living in burrows dug out of the muddy bottom. A few share their burrows with Fry's goby. It is thought the goby acts to warn the prawn when it sees something that might be dangerous. It's a relationship that's good for the prawn and the goby. The goby gets a home, while the prawn gets a security guard. The muddy ground is also home to other creatures. Slender sea pens. These animals grow like trees from the seabed. A tall one will be half a metre long. Other species can grow to over two metres. They are as fragile as they look. Flounders, like this one, also live out in the muddy parts of the bay. They spend their days cruising over the seabed, searching for shrimps, worms and other delicacies. And where the rocks and reef jut out of the mud flats, a topknot. Topknots normally live in holes and crevices, so it's a treat to see one out like this. Their camouflage is very effective. All the animals I find in the bay have adapted to suit the place they live. Some animals have adapted to life in extraordinary ways. The gurnard is a fish, but it acts more like a crab. They use those legs, which are actually fins, to walk across the seabed. When I was a child, I imagined they were underwater dragons. Over the years, I have come to understand it is the variety of different places to live in the bay that makes it such a good home to so many animals and plants. When I dive on the underwater cliffs, I am always amazed at how many types of anemones and sponges cling to the wall. They all clutch and filter plankton brought to them by the current. And on a ledge, Amongst the anemones and sponges sits a red cushion star. I often see these near soft corals. I think they feed on them, though with something that moves so slowly it's difficult to tell if it's eating or resting. Away from the ledge, a different sort of starfish makes its home. 
brittle stars congregate in areas where the current is strong. When the tide is flowing, they raise their arms to filter morsels out of the water with their tube feet. And if the current gets too strong, they link arms together and form a chain so they're less likely to be swept away. In the mouth of the bay, they cover the whole reef like a carpet. They even cover other animals living on the reef. An octopus hides nearby in a crevice. They say an octopus is as intelligent and sensitive as a cat. I imagine the brittle stars tickle and irritate her. She's had enough for now. Heading back into the ledges, I find a leopard spot goby. This one has an armoured shell crusher for a neighbour. A lobster. They may look like unlikely flatmates, but the lobster and the goby seem to get on just fine. Of all the fish in the bay, none is more colourful and extrovert as the male cuckoo wrasse. They are fiercely territorial and will chase off anyone that may be trying to steal their limelight. Females are far more discreet and timid looking. But this could change at any time because all cuckoo wrasses are born females and some turn into males when they're adults. Scientists suspect it is something to do with how many males there are in the area. If there are few males, the female will literally wear the trousers and make the change. Not everything is so pleasing to the eye. On the rocky ledges, beauty often lives next to the beast. Conger eels hunt at night and spend most of the day lying low. This one won't stay in the bay forever. One day it will leave to journey to its breeding grounds in the deep ocean. After it has bred, it will die. But eventually its young will drift back on the current to settle in our bay and continue the cycle of life. And if I am really lucky, I will see one of these curious little fish. A Jarl's Blenny. I think they look like clowns with that little tear stain in their eye. Goodness only knows what that crest is for. As summer days draw to a close, mirror calm evenings allow us to explore the most exposed rocks and reefs at the mouth of the bay. And sometimes I find an almost unbelievable nudibranch. Nudibranchs are like snails with no shells. This one is called Genolis and is about four centimetres long. Sometimes I can spend a whole dive just watching one go about its business. These are its eggs in a string of about 250. Each pearl in the string has the potential for a new life. Nearby a Devonshire cup coral clings to the rock. Most corals live together and in warm seas can form huge structures. But in the bay, Devonshire cup corals always live alone. They're tiny, but they come in an amazing variety of colours and shapes.
Beneath a rock, a squat lobster makes its home. Squat lobsters are like a cross between a lobster and a prawn. They live in all sorts of nooks and crannies. There are two different species in the bay. This is the long-clawed squat lobster. And this is the spiny squat lobster. I like the spiny squat lobster's blue face, but I'm not the only one. The octopus likes them too, but she isn't choosy. She likes the taste of them both. An octopus doesn't have a skeleton, so she can get into the tightest corners. She's hungry and on the hunt. Using her tentacles, the octopus searches in the cracks and fissures for the elusive squat lobsters. she's seen something. Once her tentacles are under the rock, her brilliant eyesight is useless. This is a job done by feel alone. The squat lobster scrabbles to escape. Nothing. not be long before she earns her supper. By autumn, baby scallops have established on the marl bed. They first attached to red algae in mid-July, but once they were big, they let go, and now lie free on the marl. They are everywhere. The marl structure gives them loads of places to hide. Although most will get eaten mainly by crabs and starfish, those that do survive will grow to 15 centimetres across and live for over 10 years. Fishermen come to Dredgar Bay to collect the scallops. My heart drops when I see a commercial scallop boat in the bay. What they are doing isn't illegal, but the heavy scallop dredges destroy all animal and plant life in their path, and habitats like the delicate marl will not recover for decades. Most of the marl in the bay has been damaged in this way. That makes the small patches we have left all the more special. I don't want to deny the fishermen a living. I just wish they would fish in a more sustainable way. In the shallows, by the plumos and enemies, I think of this year and wonder if the small anglerfish will grow to be a giant. Of the prawn and the goby and their unlikely alliance. Whether this year will be the last time I see the conger before it makes its final trip to the deep ocean. and whether the octopus will return next spring to keep those squat lobsters on their toes.
I wonder if the creatures I know will be there for my grandchildren to experience them like I have. Whether the damage being done to the sea by man can be reversed. If my bay will ever recover to its former glory and diversity. And as for me, I will keep diving and exploring a place so close to my heart it feels like a part of me. My bee.